Bom dia, pessoal. Como vão? Bem-vindos a mais uma aula do curso de introdução à engenharia de som. E hoje nós vamos ter a palestra do professor Nilesh Madhu. O Nilesh, ele é indiano, cresceu na cidade de Mumbai e depois da graduação, né, com, depois de concluir a graduação dele lá na Índia, ele foi fazer o seu mestrado e doutorado na Alemanha, na área de processamento de sinais de fala e áudio. Depois ele continuou, gostou muito da Europa, resolveu ficar por lá, é, foi fazer um pós-doc na Bélgica, depois trabalhou por um tempo na indústria, na, na NXP, que é uma um braço da, da Philips, e, e em 2017 ele entrou como professor na, na Universidade de Gante, na, na, lá na Bélgica, onde ele atua na área de processamento de sinais, e mais especificamente em aplicações de aprendizado de máquina para processamento de áudio e fala. So, Nilesh, first of all, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and for uh, accepting to talk about this hot topic that everybody is so interested about. Uh, we are, I'm sure that everybody here is eager to know how we can apply machine learning to audio and speech processing. So please, the, the, the floor is yours. Bruno, thank you for the invitation, firstly. And um, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to share um, what I know about the field, what little I know about the field, and if it inspires and interests other people, the more the merrier. So the topic of um, today's lecture, ladies and gentlemen, firstly, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, depending on where in the world you are. What I'm going to talk about are applications of machine learning in audio and speech processing, which is actually my field of expertise. Um, and uh, I, at the start, I'd also like to give thanks to my group, um, Alexander, Brecht and Jan Jue for preparing the nice audio examples you will hear later on or throughout this uh, presentation. I understand it's an introductory lecture or an introductory course, so I've tried to keep the formula to a minimum and uh, I'm going to focus more on concepts and ideas, but we can always go into detail should there be any, should there be more interest in a particular topic. So without uh, further ado, um, We've been working with audio and speech for several uh, decades right now, and it's becoming more and more interesting, especially given that communications devices uh, have evolved from tiny uh, handheld uh, mobile phones, which was already at that time a big advance where you didn't have to be tied up to a wall in order to have a conversation, to, as we see it right now, microphones being possibly embedded in all sorts of devices, allowing communication to be or effectively to be very effortless. But the proliferation of such devices not only means that we can communicate with uh, one another easily, so we have the typical uses of um, audio and speech processing, such as you want to have a conversation with a, a partner at a distant end, and um, there might be some background noise on your side, or there might be some background noise on the other person's side. You pick up this uh, signal, by the microphones on your device. Note that I said microphones. Typically, devices today have more than one microphone. And why that's interesting or why that's useful, we'll come to it shortly. And you process the signals to extract only the clean speech from the noisy mixture. Or you can process the signal in order to do a uh, speech recognition and then transcribe what is being said. Alternatives, you can use it for recording videos, and then you want only the video the audio part to focus on the region where the camera is looking at so you want to do some noise suppression there and so on but you can also use it nowadays for more exotic applications such as uh, biometrics access control if someone says a statement do you know who said it um can you also use it to communicate with your um your your new online devices like alexa or google home or uh, samsung's bixby and so on these are applications when, if you say audio speech processing, these are things you could easily come up with. But there are some more in-depth applications, such as extending this to healthcare. For example, being able to produce intelligible speech is an incredibly complex process. You have to have 
your brain, the, the organs uh, of uh, speech production, um, what you want to say, all of it to be aligned perfectly in order to produce intelligible conversational speech. If for whatever reason, either a pathological, physical reason, or because you're uh, stressed or you're depressed or you have any other kind of mental disorders, you're unable, or this, this does affect the ability to produce intelligible speech. And evidence of that is if you're very nervous and you have to give a talk, you can imagine how it is for the first couple of minutes until your mind relaxes and you get into the flow of the conversation. And thus, noting someone's speech, noting and seeing how that varies can also give us markers, biomarkers, in order to predict or to evaluate the mental and physical well-being of a person. For example, in the follow-up of uh, treatment for depression or early detection of uh, Parkinson's. So there are some very nice healthcare applications, but healthcare does not have to be confined to humans alone. Um, we have here examples of topics we worked on, healthcare and preventive maintenance in the industry. For example, if you have in the figure on the left, we have a microphone array over here, which is uh, listening to the sounds coming from a chopper blade in the steel industry. And why is this important? Because Putting a microphone, you don't need to open up a device and do any intrusive um, operations. You can pretty much stick a microphone array down to where you want to listen. And based on the audio, you can make some predictions on the state of the machine. And here we have another uh, application where we have a tanker filled with liquids that are kept in train yards. And can we buy you know, uh, by knocking on the side of the tanker, let's say by a solenoid, can we predict what the state of fill of the tanker is? And this is enormously useful because such yards contain several thousand containers. And if you want to know which of these are available to be used next, you need to be able to remotely query whether they are filled or not. It costs too much to bring each one uh, into the uh, supervision point and check its state. So these are applications of healthcare, but not necessarily applied to humans. The interesting thing is for all these applications, whether it be for speech, whether it is for healthcare, whether it's for machine monitoring, a passive acoustic monitoring, the challenges, the kind of challenges we encounter are generally the same. We need to be able to capture the audio signals in a robust way. From this audio signal, we need to be able to extract discriminative indicative features that relate to the problem we want to solve. Once we have extracted the features, we can't sit and evaluate every data point on our own. That's why we have machines. So we have to train suitable machine models that take in these features and then give us the right decision. And then we have to put all these models uh, to use in the field. And those who have been in the field for a while will recognize that each of these steps presents a machine learning challenge in itself. So let's now put this in a diagrammatic form. I'm taking the case of speech here, although you can, you can of course, um, consider any kind of signal to be present here. So there is the audio signal coming in. We extract the features from this audio signal. We, for the task at hand, whether it is improving the speech, so speech enhancement, whether it is um, trying to identify who speaks, whether it is trying to identify the background in which the audio is captured, depending on the task, we have certain model setup. Based on the input features and looking at the models, we do an analysis and then decide which of these models best fits what we have observed. And that's what I've represented here in, in terms of the Bayesian posterior probability, the probability of a particular model L given the set of features F sub I that we have observed. And having made this analysis, the next step is to make a decision. And that decision, again, depends on your application. So for example, if you want to enhance the speech, we try to find out what is the probability that the signal we're observing is speech or if it is noise. If you want to do a speaker identification, then we're looking for which model has the most probability in uh, given the set of observed, um, observed data and so on and so forth. And this brings us then nicely to the topic of machine learning, artificial intelligence. And I might be wrong, but I, I do tend to notice that there is a bit of confusion 
or let's say a tendency to say, think that machine learning is only neural networks. And there's this very nice um, figure that I found that shows machine learning is actually quite an old, well-recognized topic. And it starts from applications to robotics, uh, to human machine interfaces, to expert systems. And uh, machine learning is, you can think of it as a way for an artificial system to learn and adapt its behavior depending on the input, depending on the goal it has to achieve. Within the field of machine learning, there are several ways to do it. We have, I've listed a couple of examples here, support vector machine, random forest, uh, k-means for clustering and so on. Neural networks form a subset of machine learning where the learning part, the learning component is built up of a set of neurons which are modeled based on how the human brain perceives, processes, and uh, deals with information. So neural networks is a subset of machine learning and deep learning, which is all the rage today, is a series of interconnected neural networks and the it, it can be shown, can be um, uh, proved that such a deep neural network is capable of approximating any random function that you desire, provided you train it well. Within machine learning, so having shown that there are different topics in machine learning, how do you, how can we go about dividing these different subclasses? I like to think of it as two generic subclasses, a first one called knowledge-based machine learning. Within knowledge-based machine learning, what we do is we try to hand engineer the features. We try to decide, looking at the data, looking at our domain expertise, try to decide what features are best suited for the task at hand. Then, um, of course, these, these features should correlate with very well with what we're trying to achieve. So if you're talking about speech, then we talk about uh, the envelope of speech, talking about the pitch, the cadence in which the speech is pro spoken, the prosody and so on. We also then try to set up statistical models for how these features would behave for the different conditions. If it is speaker one, how does the extracted, how do the extracted features statistically behave? If it is another speaker, how does it behave? And then after this statistical modeling is done, we can, we typically resort to a uh, Bayes calculation, so a posterior calculation to decide the most likely model. The advantage of such knowledge-based systems is that the working because we have designed every single step of it the working of these systems is usually well understood a second class and this is a class to which deep neural networks belong or neural networks belong is that of database machine learning and a way of looking at it is you have the input data you push it through a black box system you get the output and that output could be the enhanced speech the speaker ident identity the background scene and so on um and all the necessary calculations modeling is done within the black box system. And how does this black box system learn? There is an exhaustive training phase in which you select proper training data and the desired output that the system should produce. And then you train the parameters of the system such that if you're given a particular sequence of training data uh, or you're given a particular sequence of data, it produces a set of desired outputs that you have, that you wish the system to produce. And there you can see, of course, it's very important that the training and the desired output should be properly and very carefully selected so that the system can be applied to the wide variety of data that you typically encounter in the field. A drawback? Well, the advantage of this is straightforward. You don't have to bother yourself with complicated models. Uh, you don't even necessarily need to have much of domain specific knowledge. As long as you say, this is a set of inputs, this is a set of desired outputs that I want, system you learn what you can from it and then you can say con your work is concluded but the problem with that is you don't know what the black box is doing and that can lead to bizarre results in certain conditions so to summarize if you go for knowledge based we're looking at hand engineered features domain specific knowledge we typically because of the domain specific knowledge hand engineering we work with small um, data sets so when the data that you have available to train your system is small, you would go for knowledge-based systems. On the other hand, if you have tons of data, then 
you just present this set of uh, tons of label data, let's say. Label data means uh, not only the set of uh, training inputs, but also the set of desired outputs. You're able to correlate. Um, if you have lots of data, you let the system learn internally how to map the data to the output. Um, Knowledge-based systems, because it's hand-engineered, they have the tendency to degrade in a graceful manner when unseen data is presented to them. Whereas if uh, proper care is not tracking and taken during the training procedure, then um, the database system may generalize poorly. The advantage of uh, database systems, however, is that they are way more powerful because you're not imposing any model on them. They can learn more abstract representation. They can um, and they, they can capture what we miss, for example, by trying to do a statistical modeling. Because when we do this statistical modeling, we have to be able to think of mathematical tractability. So we always try to come up with simplifying assumptions. And these don't need to be the case for data, uh, data dependent or data based approaches. So the rest of the uh, talk, I'm going to focus on certain examples and show how to uh, how we can choose for the one or the other method, depending on the knowledge and the training we have. So I'm going to start with the robust capture of data. And I'm going to focus on the case where there's only a single microphone recording available. And that microphone recording contains the desired signal, in this case, a desired speaker, plus some background noise. And it's an additive model. And we want to keep the speech and we want to suppress the noise. So if you talk about speech enhancement in this context, what it means is, um, and I'm going a little more into the practical part here, we usually take the sh short term Fourier transform of the signal, which means we analyze the signal in short overlapping fragments. We compute the discrete Fourier transform of that and the additive nature of the interference and um, uh, target overlapping means that the microphone signal can be seen as a sum of the target plus a sum of the noise. And the core idea here is whenever a time frequency point given by this index K for the frequency, the index L for the time. So whenever a point in the time frequency plane is dominated by speech, we let that point through. Whenever that is dominated by noise, we suppress it. In other words, the enhancement is simply applying a, comp a real valued mask or a gain function to the noisy microphone mixture. And this mask is typically in the range of zero to one. And I can, um, it's easy to visualize this. So here I have a short term spectrum of the microphone signal on the X axis, I have the time, on the Y axis, a frequency. And if you look at the first spectrogram, you will hardly notice a structure of speech because of all the background noise present. On the right, this, the middle plot shows you the gain function. It shows you the regions. It, you can think of the spectrum as a series of pixels. So the middle plot shows you which pixels are dominated by speech, and uh, they are represented by uh, the more red, the more um, darker the shade um, of red, the more dominant speech is there. And the more darker the shade of blue, the more that pixel is dominated by noise. So by generating this kind of a mask and applying it to the noisy mixture, what you see in the right is the signal that is generated. This is the underlying speech in this noisy mixture. Don't take my word for it. Let's have a listen. So I'm going to have the microphone signal. I'm going to play that first, and I'm going to play the process signal. Those last words were a strong statement. So this is kind of stationary noise where the characteristics of the noise don't change. Um, and there is a speech signal in it, which I hope was audible. Um, and now I'm going to play the process signal. Those last words were a strong statement. So now you hear, hopefully, the um, speech that was embedded in this noisy signal popping out a bit more. This works relatively well if the noise is stationary, but what happens if the noise is non-stationary? Non-stationary noise is a kind of noise where the, where the nature changes very dynamically with time. A simple ex example is if you're driving in a car at a steady speed, then the noise inside the car is more or less stationary. It's a low frequency hum, the wind perhaps passing by, but generally it's a kind of stationary uh, setting that you have. But if you go into a pub or a cafe or into a football stadium, especially when a goal has been scored, then the kind of noise that you encounter there is extremely non-stationary. The range of uh, the amplitude of the noise varies dynamically from time to time. And let's see how the system works in that case. Those last words were a 
last words were a strong statement. So you hear the same speech, there is some background noise and there are some impulsive events coming in. And if I apply the same kind of mask estimation, those last words were a strong statement. Here you hear a lot more of the interference coming in. Impulsive noises are not uh, picked up. Why? Because in this case, all I had was one microphone signal and I had to do everything uh, to clean up that one signal. And I assume no a priori knowledge. So what we did, we looked at the signal and we looked at parts of the signal that were more or less stationary and said, this is what the noise looks like. Everything that has um, a, a larger dynamic range than this stationary portion must be speech. And we use that in order to generate the mask, which obviously fails if the background is not stationary. And um, what can we conclude from that? Well, it works well if the assumptions meet well with the actual situation. And you can see this method as a very simple machine learning approach. But can we improve further on this? We can. How? And then we go into model-based approaches or knowledge-based approaches or data-based approaches. So let's concentrate on the uh, knowledge-based approaches first, where we say, the more we know about what we want to do, the more a priori information we can bring in to the task we want to accomplish, the more we can actually get out of it. So for example, we want to extract speech in background noise. Let's employ models of speech and hearing. If we want to only pick out one speaker, let's try and bring in that speaker's characteristic into the system. If we know what kind of situations that the uh, signal will typically be picked up in, let's try and factor in the noise characteristics also in the system as an a priori condition. And we bring in this extra knowledge, we try to distill the relevant features out of it and factor it into our enhancement approaches. And I call this then structured knowledge based approaches. The alternative is to say, we want to extract speech from all the random kinds of background noise. So we create databases of different kinds of noisy mixtures and always, and then pass this onto a system which should learn to extract only the speech that is embedded in these noisy mixtures. And that's the black box system, the data-based approach. Let's try to start with the knowledge-based approach first to, um, to give you an idea of um, and the speech processing uh, and show how the knowledge can be built in. We need to understand the model or the mechanism of speech production. And speech production is, I have said, yes, it's a complex process. You need to know what to say and it's, it's controlled um, from having a thought to voicing it. But in the physical sense, speech is simply the modulation of an airstream that is generated from your lungs. The, this airstream can be obstructed by your voice blocks or the uh, glottis and uh, the glottal folds, they prevent the air from escaping if they are closed or if they're open, they let the air escape in a kind of turbulent manner. Within speech, there are two classes. The first kind of speech that comes up when you say the vowel sounds like an A ah or an O. Oh. And what happens in these cases, the glottis, the muscles, they open and close in a periodic way, letting the air out as pulses. This pulse strain is then modulated by your throat, your mouth, your, your palate, the, um, which is then, which, which can be modeled as a series of resonators. And this gives a particular color to the sound. The, 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 the difference between an A ah or an O oh is just in the way you keep your mouth. The glottis, the, the signal up to the point of the pulse strength is the same. That is what we call the class of voiced sounds. The class of unvoiced sounds is where the glottis is open and the air escapes as a turbulent rush. Again, it's modeled, uh, again, it's modulated by the way you configure your, um, uh, your, your um, oral cavity and um, gives rise to different sounds, whether you say a sh or a, a d or a t. These are the ways you would, you, you would uh, have the air come out um, without a periodic uh, pulsation, but you, because of the way you then um, configure your articulators, you're able to produce different sounds. And we call these unvoiced. Essentially, if you look at voice or unvoiced, it doesn't matter. There is a signal that is your airstream, and there is a modulation by the vocal tract, which is then your all pole fill, which is modeled as a series of resonators, which we may see as an all pole filter. And the product of these gives you your speech. So there are two aspects here. 
the airstream production. That's what we call the excitation signal and the modulation or the shaping of this airstream, which we call the envelope. And interestingly, whereas the, uh, let's say, if, when, it, when you come to voice sounds, the period at which these pulses are produced, that determines the pitch of the voice. The shape of the articulators, that decides the color of the sound in the sense of the, the difference between different phonemes, for example. So if you have a good idea of what the envelope looks like, you also have a good idea of what is being said, which is the fundamental basis on which speech recognizers are, were built. So if you want to incorporate this machine learning uh, into the system, then what do we do? We have um, to recognize that the, uh, we have certain characteristics for speech. If it's a voice segment, we identify the fundamental frequency, the harmonics, and we just boost these because we know that they are prominent in the speech. So the, in terms of machine learning, if you want to cast it into a machine learning problem, find out features in the signal that tell you whether this, the speech segment you're observing is voiced or not. Then based on whether it's voiced or not, if it's voiced, estimate the fundamental frequency and then boost the frequencies corresponding to the fundamental frequency and the harmonics. You can add more structure to the problem um, by considering or by understanding that we have the envelope. Now, the envelope is formed by a variation or a modification of your vocal track, and there is only a certain limited ways in which you can do that. You have no way to go to extremes. Because of this limited variability, you can train code books which recognize different configurations of the vocal track and thereby the different phonemes. And so you can come back to a different kind of model where you say, first, look at your signal to decide whether the whether the segment you're observing is speech in noise or just noise. If it is speech, what kind of phoneme is being said? What is the envelope corresponding to it? Then you put in that envelope from the code book and if it's voiced also include the pitch improvements. And so you have a simple way to include domain specific knowledge into an enhancement structure. And um, this can be done in several ways. Either you use statistical modeling by the Gaussian mixture models, hidden Markov models, or you say you're going to do this also by a deep neural network, the classification by deep neural network. So you have a classification DNN or the prediction of the envelope directly, a regression based DNN, and then the rest of the steps, once you have the envelope, follow in a straightforward way by identifying regions where the speech is dominant and preserving these and suppressing everything to do with the noise. I'll give you an example of how this works. We have here a noisy speech signal. But when the rabbit actually took a watch out of its waistcoat pocket and looked at it and then hurried on, Alice started to repeat, for it flashed across her mind that she had never before seen a rabbit with either a waistcoat pocket or a watch to take out of it. If we choose the classical way where we estimate only the, only the um, stationary background noise and try to factor this information to derive the separation or the noise suppression mask, this is what we obtain. But when the rabbit actually took a watch out of its waistcoat pocket and looked at it and then hurried on, Alice started to repeat, for it flashed across her mind that she had... I'm not going to play the whole thing. Uh, I think you get the picture. You, you do get some imp improvement, but there are some variations, especially you see that there are some parts of speech that are completely attenuated um, or not very well reproduced. And then we can bring in the envelope structure, which then gives you something that like this. Um, just a minute. Um... But when the rabbit actually took a watch out of its waistcoat pocket and looked at it and then hurried on, Alice started to repeat, for it flashed across her mind that she had never... The background interference, the non-stationary components are better suppressed because I'm now trying to enhance only the speech-related components. If you look at the spectra as well, you might be able to see the difference. It is always challenging to play back speech enhancement um, uh, solutions over a online uh, call or an online presentation. So, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, quite uh, prepared to accept that it might not be as evident to you as me listening with my headphones. Um, and here's when you also incorporate not only the envelope, but also the pitch, and then you can perhaps see already more structure evolving in the signal compared to any of the other spectra. And then if I play that bit. But when the rabbit actually took a watch out of its waistcoat pocket and looked at it and then hurried on, 
Alice started to her feet, for it flashed across her mind that she had never before seen a rabbit with either a waistcoat pocket or a watch to take out of it. And here's the noisy for the comparison. But when the rabbit actually took a watch out of its waistcoat pocket and looked at it... So that's what we can achieve when we bring in uh, knowledge over the, the classical methods. And uh, we can also do this extra knowledge uh, incorporation by the use of DNNs. And then I just want to share a small uh, insight from one of our recent-ish papers where we compared the envelope estimation by the use of a DNN, uh, either a classifier DNN or a regression DNN, or by a standard statistical model in terms of two metrics, the quality of the speech versus how much of noise is suppressed. And I won't go into the details of the graph, but what you see is that all the methods, they perform in quite a similar way. And why is this? Because the problem that we were looking at was a constraint problem. Whether we use the DNN or whether we use a statistical model, we just wanted to predict a particular envelope. And uh, because of this constraint model, the statistical methods were quite able to perform or predict the model well enough. And adding the DNN didn't bring in any additional value or not uh, that significant an addition to what the statistical methods could do. In other words, if the model can be, if the problem can be well modeled using traditional methods, the traditional approaches, it's very unlikely that the DNN is going to beat that if it is applied to the same problem. We can choose to have other DNN methods which don't work on such envelope constrained uh, representations. And they are really the subject of uh, research currently. But what is interesting is that speech and speech, if you have two speakers speaking at the same time, that still remains challenging and we can see what we can do there. Um, Bruno, how much time do I have? Um, I realize I'm... 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, good, <laughs> then I'll have to speed up a bit. Um, so single microphone, limited possibility, multiple microphones allow us then um, to make use of the fact that you're sampling the sound field at different locations in order to then focus on a particular direction. Um, so if you have a real environment, the sound that reaches you does not just come from the source to the microphone. It's also captured by the reflections from the walls and from the other um, objects in the room. And this set of uh, reflections is what we term a room impulse response. Now, um, if you look at two microphone systems, then what we have are two microphones set at different locations and we're capturing signals from, uh, uh, from, from different perspectives, so to speak. And therefore, if you have two speakers and two microphones, we can form this as a kind of linear equation where we have two equations and two unknowns. This is the basis with which we start trying to separate multiple sources from a signal mixture. And uh, we pose again this problem in the frequency domain and we make one additional assumption and that is um, each frequency has a solution that's independent of the others. And what do we choose when we want to solve uh, for all these, uh, for, for these different frequencies? There is one common aspect that ties the different frequencies together, and that is signals belonging to a particular source must come from the same physical location. So for if each frequency, if you can find out where or which location in space that component comes from, we are able to separate the signals. And um, how do we do the source localization? That's actually quite simple. We have two microphones and we have uh, the uh, wave, we have the sound field uh, generated by uh, the speaker, the sound waves propagating towards the microphones. And as if you're sufficiently far from the speakers, you may see this as a plane wave. Because of the orientation of the speaker, you will see that the sound wave hits the microphones at different times. If we assume that the orientation is given by the angle theta and the distance between the microphones is D, then the, second, the signal at the second microphone is a delayed version of the signal at the first microphone by an extra delayed tau, which is geometrically related to the location of the speaker. So if we can identify the tau, we can locate the different speakers, and then we can use that for the separation. We also make one additional assumption for speech, and that is if you have two speakers and you take their spectra and overlap them, there are very few points where these spectra will overlap. 
And because of that, we can treat for each frequency the signal as being completely dominated by the one speaker or the next. And so if you do localization independently at each frequency, find the most um, um, active source for that frequency, then what we can do is dominate, uh, localize the dominant source at a particular frequency, time frequency point. So at any point, you will localize either the first source or the second source. And by doing these individual estimates, the different thetas, you can get some kind of a distribution. And then you can fit standard statistical models to these distributions. And uh, where you say the centroids of these uh, models, they represent the different locations. And um, you can factor this information in again in a base way in order to, um, sorry, in order to find out whether a time frequency point was dominated by a speaker or not. Again, think about what I said at the start, statistical model, Bayes inference. What we are tending to do at the recent, uh, recently is to throw all of that again away and say, we can do all of this with a machine. And what we are doing in the machine is simply saying, we have a certain structure for a neural network. The features to this neural network are the phases between the different microphones because time delay in on the signals corresponds to a phase shift at each frequency. So you're given the set of phase differences or the phases of the microphones to the neural network. Let the neural network output the different locations from which it perceives the activity. And uh, we have no other, we have imposed no other model on this. All we have done is generated several sets of training data with sources coming from different locations and um, telling the neural network to predict the uh, location from which the source was uh, generated. And what we see here is that in such cases, such uh, because this, uh, uh, this such a model implicitly learns how to model reverberation, how to model the different reflections in the room, how to factor in um, the, the uh, you know the strength of the direct signal with respect to the uh, reflected components. It does much better than the classical approaches. And what I have um, here are results for three microphone or nine microphone arrays. I think what is important to focus on is the fact that at a signal to noise ratio of minus five dB, um, we plot here um, the, the one minus accuracy, let's say. Um, so the lower the value, the better it is. So this point here actually stands for 95% accuracy. And uh, these, this point here stands for about 70% accuracy. And you can see that, and, and the y axis is in the logarithmic scale. So you can see that in comparison with this classical approaches given by the orange and the red lines, the pink one, which corresponds to a neural network based approaches significantly outperforms it by a factor of 15 to 20%, even under very severe conditions. And then we realized one of the nice things about such neural networks is it all depends on the training. So now we focus on the training for the localization by twisting the training around by twisting the, the goal of the neural network around by twisting what we expect from the neural network in a slightly different way. With the same data, we can also train the neural network to separate the sources, to extract, in fact, the targets from the different directions. And um, it, it, that was actually quite interesting for us because the, the way we generated the data remained the same. The architecture of the neural network, except for the output layer perhaps, remained the same. Only at the output layer, instead of giving us which directions were active, we asked the neural network to give us which sources were present in the signal. So it output multiple streams, or in this case, output a stream corresponding to each direction we wanted to look at or to listen to. And to give you an idea of what this sounds like, I'm presenting a noisy signal here. You have two speakers in a noisy background. A rod is used to catch pink salmon. It's easy to tell the depth well. The box was thrown. I don't think it's easy to pick out one speaker over the other. Um, so I'm going to play it now after we pass it through the neural network. Oops. A rod is used to catch pink salmon. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. The box was thrown beside the parked truck. Four hours of steady work based on... And then here's the other signal. Horn cobs can be used to kindle a fire. 
Acid burns holes in wool cloth. Eight miles of woodland burned to waste. A young child should not... Um, what I've done here is ask the neural network to again give me a mask which tells me at which points my desired speaker is present um, for a particular direction and I'm just applying this mask onto the back onto the noisy mixture and it's particularly challenging because all I have are three closely spaced microphones about two and a half centimeters apart from each other in a triangular form and the sources are two meters from this tiny microphone array in a room where there is significant reverberation. Um, I have a more challenging case, but I think in the interest of time, I can skip it. We can perhaps listen to it uh, in the um, uh, question and answer session if there is interest. But what I want to focus on is that this seems almost magical, and it is indeed quite magical that you have a black box that gives you the output from a mixture. But a good part of the magic also goes into how you select or generate the training data. And I want to reiterate what I said here previously that the way you generate the training decides how well your network is going to function. So if you give it data that is quite representative of what it is going to encounter in a real test, then it performs better. If your data has a huge mismatch with what you finally expect the network to see, it's going to fail quite miserably. So we need training data that is representative. At the same time, we need to be able to generate it in a way that we can um, amass easily tons of data without significant effort because for training such neural networks with a large number of parameters, we also need a huge set of training data. So what are the, uh, for, for the case of, and this is something, how to generate training data representative of the task is dependent on the task and the, ex, uh, and the surroundings uh, and the environment. In our case, we want to localize and separate speakers. So what are the factors we have to take into account? The reverberation, the fact that the sources, there might be more than one source uh, at a time, that the sources are not going to be always active, that they will pause in the middle and you don't have people talking all the time. This is an example. Um, and then that the sources don't stay put in one location, they can move around. And so how do we do that? We, for the reverberation, we generated simulated room impulse responses from well-known shoebox acoustic. This is why domain knowledge is important. You need to know how to generate such uh, acoustic models. Um, we also generate for different source array positions. For pauses, we either train on real speech, which has these pauses built in, or we use noise for training, but build these pauses in by some stochastic model. Again, you can't escape some basic knowledge of signal processing and uh, mathematics and statistics. To model the movement, we every time the speech speaker pauses, we ask him to jump to a different direction or her to a different direction, simulated, of course, in order to sim in order to um, obtain this dynamic situation as well. Done again for here with a simple first order Markov model. And this is what happens when you do it properly versus when you do it improperly. In the first case, we train the system to recognize so to localize sources, we didn't build in any movement, we didn't build in any pauses. What did the system do? The red bars, by the way, in this plot tell you the actual points when this particular source was active and at which location given on the x-axis. And what we see is that the system localizes the first source perfectly, but after the source has fallen silent, which is around this point here, it doesn't forget it anymore because it is not expected to. It has localized the source. It believes the source will always be there and it continues to pre predict it. And then when the second source starts, it predicts and localizes the source as well. You can quickly see how this is going to fail. But when you bring in this movement, when you bring in the proper training, you do see, yes, it starts localizing the first source. As the source dies out, it preserves it for a while, as we also would tend to do. If you have, you're looking at something and that event has died out, there is a tendency to wait the hysteresis. And then when the second source start after a short while, it picks it up and then continues to localize. Key, you need to have good training data. A last point I want to bring in, uh, if I have five minutes for this one, is the other applications of audio. So we talked about capture. Now I want to talk about applications. Audio analytics can be everything from the analysis of um, the emotion, the scene, um, the, the, the um, language, and so on. And here you need, as we have seen, proper data. And we have a couple of scenarios, a low resource scenario and a high resource scenario. 
low resource scenario for speech is around one to 100 hours of data, high resource, and this is a rule of thumb, 100 plus hours of data. Obtaining this data is very costly. For example, if you want to have emotive speech, imagine how much of effort is going to be to transcribe properly each sentence with the corresponding emotion. And you have to have someone who is qualified in order to read the emotion as well. So this is an, it's kind of an ad hoc curve. All that it tries to say is that as an amount of data is low, your traditional approaches perform well. As the amount of data you have increases, deep learning methods can significantly outperform this. And I want to give you an example of this. If you choose uh, deep learning, you'll of course have deep neural networks, time delay convolutional neural networks and so on. If you choose the traditional approaches, what you do is again, work with Gaussian mixture model, um, Bayesian inference, and these kind of approaches. So again, you see two distinct classes of methods for machine learning beginning to crystallize in the sense of how often they are used. The features that you extract in both these cases, the inputs to both these systems are the same, and that's an estimate of the signal envelope, as we, uh, as I showed you in one of the first slides. Um, so you have the speak signal envelope, you generate some uh, statistical models from it, and based on these models, you uh, train it for a particular task at hand. If you have a um, if you want to do speaker uh, identification, then it's the speaker specific uh, Gaussian mixture models that are trained. You want to do scene identification or background identification, you train the appropriate models and so on. Um, so if you have, for example, the uh, there is a challenge called the uh, D-case challenge, detection and classification of acoustic scenes. It's been going on since 2016. And they have here 15 acoustic scenes, 10 hours, uh, different uh, recordings per scene. And if you choose a statistical method, we have an accuracy of around 88%, which is actually quite in line with what a neural network state of the art achieves, which is 89%. Um, we also apply this in-house to stress detection, but I won't go into the details of that. Again, there, more data, the better the performance of your statistical methods, but the basic engine that we use remains the same for all the applications. Then we have a large scale data set. Suppose we have uh, the, the celebrity identification. You have two sentences. What you want to do here is identify whether the, celebrity, this, the same person has spoken both these sentences. And because you need huge amounts of data and these are difficult to generate, people have come up with an innovative way of doing it. And that is, if you want to talk about um, identifying the voices of celebrities, look on YouTube for videos, put in a face um, classification or a face detection algorithm, see if that face tags the same person or the celebrity, and then choose all the audio segments that you have there tagged by that same face to generate, to represent audio samples for that celebrity. By this, you can easily generate large number of data, amounts of data. And the and here you see really the power of uh, such deep learning methods when the number of uh, data points increase. Statistical methods give you an equal error rate about five to 8%. You choose X vectors. X vectors are simply uh, neural network based feature extractors. And they are called X vectors because the authors were fans of the X-Men uh, cartoon series. So if you use X vectors, uh, then you get an equal error rate of 1.2 to 4%. And uh, lately, uh, colleagues of ours in Ghent have shown that um, if you further um, enhance these, uh, these, the neural network architectures used again with this large amount of data, you come to an error rate of less than half a percent. And this is on data from 7,000 plus celebrities. And that shows the enormous potential that we have of machine learning when applied in the correct manner. To summarize then, I hope uh, in the, <laughs> I've got perhaps a little off uh, more uh, beyond the allocated time, but you see that it's because there's such a huge variety of tasks to which you can apply machine learning and audio. And we are able to do this today because we have increased data, we have increased computational power, which has fueled the improvement also or in the, in the methods, in the mathematical um, development for improving these methods. But important to keep in mind, it's not sim enough to say simply data, neural network, um, give me the result. You also have to invest in generating proper training data. You don't do that, your machine or system is going to fail. And uh, when you have the data and the, uh, the, the architecture in place, 
you can see that there are straightforward extensions possible of existing architecture to do a wide variety of problems. Key remains, of course, when you have a task, you have a lot of tools at hand, please choose the right tool for your task. You don't have to use, as I say, a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Thank you. And comments, questions, always welcome now or per email. Thank you very much, Nivesh. A great talk. Really, it's a vast world of machine learning that's able to be applied in several aspects of audio. And you did a great job of uh, pinpointing several aspects of it. Thank you once again. I will first uh, let William uh, make one uh, question that is a very general question and then yeah. we'll go for the more specific ones. Yeah. Uh, uh, at first, uh, thanks for the great presentation. It was uh, very nice. I, I learned a lot. Uh, we have a couple of questions in YouTube in here, but I, I will uh, say my my personal question first. Could you, could you say briefly about overfitting and ideas and how to avoid it or overcome it? Indeed, um, overfitting is when um, I don't have a the example I showed you here for the localization is is a, indeed a good example of overfitting. Overfitting is when um, your system becomes too dependent on the training data that it has seen. And this typically happens when the, the number of parameters in the neural network is so vast compared to the amount of data points, the number of data points you feed it, that the system actually learns or memorizes each of the input patterns you have fed it. And therefore, it might perform very well on the set of training data that you have given it. But if something slightly divergent from what you've given comes in, the system might fail. That's the problem of overfitting. How do you avoid overfitting? Generate lots of representative data. Make sure that you have a factor of 10 more data points than you have uh, the number of parameters. Um, what else could you do with, uh, with, with overfitting is um, when you generate the training data, you can generate small modifications on it so as to make a huge diversity of patterns such that the system forget, or does not tend to focus too much on, on the one pattern. Um, I would say these are typical rules of thumb to avoid uh, overfitting. And uh, I think this, this figure illustrates it best. Here we only said localize a signal and if at a particular location, we never said anything about forgetting it. And there was over, kind of an overfitting to saying it has located, there is nothing in it that says a source must die out. So you build that knowledge in um, into the system. Okay, thank you. Thank and you. I think with this explanation, you also replies to, to one of the questions from Stefan, that was how robust the algorithm is to sources, sources that are moving. So. It is robust uh, as long as you do the proper training. Indeed. Uh, Stefan also asked uh, when you were talking about uh, speech recognition, uh, is the analysis, you, you present an, an, an analysis in frequency domain, and is it sufficient to distinguish speech in any language, or are there other time dependent features that are required dependent of speech, of, of language? Um, speech recognition, um, yeah, speech recognition is not really something I'm very familiar with. Um, let me put it this way. Um, if you have a recognizer train for English, if you feed it, uh, Basa Indonesia, it will try to interpret whatever it sees as, uh, something it has learned. Um, that's because that's all it's been trained to do on the. Uh, so that, that's a problem. So you probably will need to identify language and then use probably the, the correct um, recognizer for it. So language identification followed by, um, for, by, for, by speech and, uh, recognition. By the way, uh, to digress slightly, this is, a pre this is a problem when you have context switching. Um, in, in, in countries like India, we have several languages and we switch very fluently from one language to another, sometimes multiple times within the same sentence. And this makes it difficult for if you if you then try to feed in such sentences to a Google recognizer, it's amazing what it will come up with. Um, but speech recognition also you uh, they, 
you do incorporate not just an instantaneous spectrum, there is also the temporal context that's taken into account. So the more data you have and the more the language models that are built in, the more it will be able to correct its prediction based on the language model and the increasing number of uh, data points that it obtains. So frequently, if you have this um, uh, speech recognition to dictate where you dictate and it notes down, you will find it frequently correcting words up to one or two sentences beyond um, previous to what where you are currently, simply based on how you're, um, what you're saying. So it starts building the context in. Indeed. I don't know if that's a full answer to the question. Um, but if there is a specific one, shoot it to me. And I have colleagues working on the field and I'd be very happy to forward that question. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, would Tulu, Tulu Shaw, did you want to, to open up uh, your mic and shoot your question? Should I read it? Uh, good afternoon, Nilesh, can you hear me? Yes, Tulio, good afternoon. Uh, initially, I would like to thank you for the excellent lecture. Uh, I've been looking for jobs uh, opening on audio and vibration machine learning. And what I find uh, most are jobs related to traditional machine learning algorithms. Uh, so I'll, I would like to know your vision or predictions about audio deep learning in industry. Is it already happening or is it still uh, a distant uh, reality? Yet? Okay. Um, I believe and that's my personal uh, opinion. If you have a limited data set, you can't use deep learning. Um, industry is beginning to use machine learning. It's beginning to, uh, and the reason why typically traditional methods are used is because the data in industry is very hard to come by. Properly labeled data in industry is very hard to come by. As if the, the data remains limited because of the application, for whatever reason, I can't think of, uh, I, I have one where we had steel industry, we had to note when a blade was blunted. It was very difficult for us to find properly labeled data um, because um, there is no set protocol. There is no way you can synthesize the data. There's no way you can simulate or generate uh, data for training models. In that sense, deep, uh, deep learning models would be difficult to apply. If the data that is available increases, then I would say we can think of deep learning approaches. So I think it depends very much on the industry you're in. If you can generate vast amounts of data in your armchair, so to speak, by using computer models, deep learning models will be more powerful. If you're having a paucity of data, then it's better to use traditional methods, um, at least in the beginning, and as the, you, and, and use, uh, and as the, uh, the amount of data you gather improves, think more of, um, uh, say, deep learning. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, and also in the in the sense uh, in YouTube, Davi asked uh, that you showed examples all, always with speech, but do you have experience with other sources, or how would you approach domain uh, bias transfer to include other sources? So I think this is already answered as, uh, with uh, example on the steel industry. Um, yes, um, but uh, what we noticed was, um, maybe to go on to it, other sources, um, we did, so this, this approach um, for the source localization um, was actually generated for speech. We found it was possible to train these networks based on simply white noise as an input, so long as we, because we're talking about the spatial characteristics. So in, in this sense, it was not, including speech improved it uh, slightly for speech, but we found the method generalized also to other kinds of sources. Now, to what extent it continues to generalize is difficult to say, um, but there is a certain mm, flexibility with, with these kind of models, uh, especially because of the features that we're using. It's not um, signal related, but more, let's say, related to the, the spatial uh, location of, of the source. Now, if I had a single microphone approach, which I tried to enhance, speech, I don't think that would generalize very well to other kinds of sources. You might probably need to train with those different kinds of sources in order to extract them. Okay. Always, uh, we, we notice that it's always very specific to the application that, you, that you're aiming at. What is possible though, is uh, to do some kind of transfer learning where you train, uh, for example, um, 
the um, the architectures that have been trained um, the architectures we had trained for speaker recognition you can take up most of the architectures to the extent of feature uh, recognition and except for the penultimate layer or say a layer or two before that you take that architecture and then add another let's say concatenate a separate set of uh, layers which then um, ap apply the same uh, which then try to let me uh, take a step back um, when we use a deep neural network for example for the speaker identification the neural network itself extracted the relevant features that could allow it to pinpoint one speaker amongst a whole set or cohort of speakers given to it in the training which means there was implicitly somewhere a robust feature extraction which um, could could cluster if you will uh, different classes uh, the classes being then the different speaker identity uh, speaker identities you take that neural network take off the part that does specific speaker prediction but add on another part that is then trained to predict different acoustic scenes for example or different emotions then the feature extraction can still continue to the, uh, the to, to some extent to extract the robust uh, underlying features but then the subsequent layers will then focus on the specific topic uh, or the specific task at hand so there is a way in order to extract what you have um, and then add other layers to it in order to uh, adapt it to the task at hand. So, great. Uh, I will ask all, uh, only two further questions because we already reached our time limit. So we're going to go a bit, bit over it. But uh, there is one interesting question from Pablo that is, uh, if you're using, talking about your localization uh, algorithm, if you, you have your microphone placed in a person that is moving, how difficult would it be to apply the localization method in this case? Um, if the microphone is fixed to the speaker, but then there is no localization required, right? It's it's there where the, the microphone is where the speaker is. I'm, I'm not sure if I understand that uh, question, actually. I get you know, what he's uh, saying is that you have a microphone fixed to, to the person. You, you probably want to in his in a factory, I, I'm guessing, and you want to localize sounds on on this uh, environment. But I guess the problem here is that you, you also need some extra sensors to tell the localization yeah. of the person. Right? Uh, you can use that. Well, if you if you have um, in in some ways, you can think of these as if you, as your wireless earbuds for communication. You have the small microphone array that's plugged into your ear, and as you speak, it knows that you are speaking because of the location with respect to um, it, because it knows roughly where your mouth is. So it focuses on that region, and everything else could be unwanted interference. And yeah, this is feasible, of course. Yeah, I think Paul is uh, thinking about uh, in an uh, industry setting, you want to localize machines in, if you're all wearing. Um, you, you can do that in the sense of um, you, you can uh, identify a machine if you know, if you have some idea of what that machine sounds like. Then as you walk through the factory and you hear the machines, you can say, OK, I, I, I identify this kind of sound. Perhaps I'm close to a machine A or machine B, which I know from um from from my prior experience that i've uh, mm -hmm. recorded and then you go into clustering right exactly and then you can roughly pinpoint where the person is if you hear overlap of machine a and machine b okay is roughly somewhere in the middle of that well, uh one last question and that comes from vinicius vinicius do you want to to open up your mic and shoot your question uh hello uh, I, I, I have a question uh, I put in the chat. Uh, I don't have much ability in speaking English, but because it I put including I put in the chat for you can read. Okay, I, I will just do uh, regard things. So he, Vinicius, he is uh, concluding his bachelor's, and he he would like to he. He likes music and signal processing, so he was thinking about building a software or a, uh, a machine learning algorithm to extract sheet music from um, from music. 
So do you, have, do you know anything about, do you have an experience on that? Do you know of any uh, research in that area? What is your take on, on that? Would, would that be a viable project for a bachelor's uh, thesis? Um, definitely there has been research done on this. Um, uh, for I know of, uh, I, I can look it up, but I, I can't think of a paper immediately, but I have um, seen work that tries to extract piano notes from what is played. And that's kind of the, the sheet music. Of course, the more complex the, um, the piece you're playing, the more difficult it gets. There has also worked, for example, um, for the Indian uh, drum, which is played by hand and it has a certain, certain different variations. There has also been work on trying to extract with classical methods and deep learning, the specific stroke and transcribing this. So yes, work has been done on this um, uh, in the past. Whether it's going to be a feasible thesis, yes, it's feasible. Um, we have to be practical as well. So you start off with, say, simple, single, or uh, not, not too complicated chords that you want to pick up and identify. And when that works, uh, proceed to more complex pieces. Cool. I hope that is a uh, mm -hmm. full answer to the question. Yeah, just uh, as a, now from my point of view, knowing that we have a bachelor thesis is only a six month project here at our university. Uh, you have to be very uh, practical on, on what you choose to do. But you can get quite some good stuff uh, even in six months. It's simple, but it's a foundation for uh, building for up later on. Work. Yes. So we are uh, already almost 10 minutes over. So I will stop now and let Nilesh go and have his break. So, Thank you. <laughs> I know it's late, late in the evening there for you. But uh, once again, thank you very much for your time and for giving us this uh, great presentation. We want to give a hand of applause for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. I enjoyed it as well. Guys, uh, thank you everybody for attending and see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye. See you guys. See you.